Thank you very much uh, for inviting me along. Thank you, Abby, for setting me up for this, and Marianne for the introduction, and everybody else involved in pulling this together. Uh, I I'm Gary Fuller. I work at uh, Imperial College London. I'm also a sort of science ambassador for a thing called the Clean Air Programme, which is a very large portfolio of research uh, that's going on in the UK. So my job is to connect all the scientists together and to connect them with the areas outside it, with policy makers and with the wider stakeholders. And hence coming along to talk here today fits really neatly uh, within that. I wanted to talk um, about how do we know about the health harm from air pollution and then a few things about what can be done about it. Now, many of you are activists within the sort of climate domain, and there there is a great deal of, let's say, climate denial, and there are many people that spend a long time... Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> You read my mind. Uh, spend a long time trying to sort of blur things with uncertainty and counter-narratives. In, in the air pollution arena, I, I think we actually get less uh, of that because air pollution science has been much more developed over many years. But you only have to look in the newspapers in the last couple of weeks and you can see things like London's ultra-low emission zone coming up, being discussed, things around wood burning, controversy over what targets the government are, are setting. And if you look then onto social media about these things, you can start to see a lot of other narratives being put forward by people that are either saying this effect isn't real or just that it, it isn't important. And so, therefore, I wanted to start by talking about the health harms from air pollution, just so that if you're engaged in discussion or debate, at least you can have some glimpse into where the evidence comes from and the type of harms that it does. And then I'll move on to um, some uh, solutions. So, one, I'm going to start with the health harm from uh, air pollution. And these are kids in East London that we did a study on, and I'll, I'll come back and, and visit them uh, again. You'll see them a little bit later. Now, let's start from a global perspective. Um, air pollution is a global health emergency. And that isn't just me standing here trying to give it a bit of hyperbole to make it sound, you know, interesting or, or, or alarming. This is the line from the World Health Organization. We think that because of breathing polluted air, somewhere in the region of about 4.9 million people are dying early across the globe each year. And that's people just from outdoor air pollution. Indoor air pollution is other things uh, on top of that. And if you're interested to find more about these things globally, try the state of global air reports um, of which they're there in the corner. And I think the slides should be available uh, somehow afterwards. So where does all this happen? Well, the worst air pollution in the world really sits in, in this arc um, from Africa over towards India and China. And if we think about the populations of some of these countries, we've got more than a billion people in India, more than a billion people in China. If you think about the countries that are around that, they're extremely populous. So if we were to think of a circle somewhere about here, then around half of humanity lives in that. And they're experiencing some of the worst air pollution on uh, the planet. And it's having quite uh, an effect. You'll have seen, I'm sure, lots of pictures of smog and London in the past, and I'll go to some of them a little bit later. Um, this is actually a contemporary one. Um, I write for The Guardian as well as doing science at uh, Imperial, and uh, this was attached to one of my articles um, by someone from the picture desk, and this shows someone cycling to work in, uh, in India today. You know, this isn't a shot from Victorian times. This isn't a shot from the 1950s in London. This is someone and what they're experiencing today. So how about the health impacts of air pollution in the UK? We've got a whole range of estimates to choose from 
in terms of the headline figures for how many people are dying earlier each year from air pollution. Uh, we've got, they range from somewhere about 100,000 to uh, around about 30 odd thousand. The one from government, which is, I don't know, the one that's probably most tuned to the UK circumstance, says between 29 and, and 43,000 people uh, are dying early each year because of the nitrogen dioxide, which is a polluting gas, and PM 2.5, which are tiny particles in the air. And it's the, it, this exposure is shortening their lives. And I'll show a little bit about where that comes from. Some figures from Brighton and Hove suggest that around 170 of us in the city are dying earlier than we should do each year because of the air that we're breathing. This all sounds, of course, really, really abstract. We talk about 4.9 million people globally. We're talking about tens of thousands of people in the UK, but they, these are individuals. Individuals are dying from air pollution. And of course, you'll have seen in the news about the tragic death of uh, Ella Kisadeba, who lived um, on just, off, just on the South Circular uh, in Lewisham. And this, is the, this February marks the 10th anniversary of her death. And here's a photograph here of her and her mates. And it's an important reminder um, that these are real people whose lives are being affected. It's not just abstract uh, statistics. So how do we know that air pollution is causing all of these harms? So I said I'll go through a little tour of some of the little bits of evidence that tell us how we know these things. So I'll start this back in 1952. And this winter marks the 70th anniversary of London's Great Smog uh, uh, of 1952. If you've seen the episode of The Crown about this, has anyone seen the episode of The Crown on this? <laughs> yeah, um, don't believe very much of it. <laughs> it's very, very fictionalised. Um, so what actually happened? So here's some data. These are days in December 1952. And up here in the vertical axis, we have deaths per day on this side, and we have two metrics of uh, air pollution. So this one here, for those of you at the back, is telling us about deaths. And here you can see this spike here uh, in terms of air pollution. So sulfur dioxide and smoke, which is similar to PM 2.5 we have today. This incident that happened in London over the space of just short of a week in the Department of Health report that then followed um, was thought to have killed around 4,000 Londoners from air pollution that they breathed over about a five or six day period. If you'll notice, the deaths start here and at the end of the analysis they're up here. And this was kind of left out of the original report. And in 2001 there was a reanalysis of this, if you like, these continuing excess deaths uh, that then followed and it was put at around 12,000 people. So probably before we had COVID, but it's, uh, you know, um, it's worse than the worst periods of cholera that affected London in Victorian times, and certainly worse than the worst periods of uh, the, the bombing in the Blitz. So it's a massive disaster for London. Um, the interesting thing is that it's really the first time that officialdom acknowledged that air pollution was killing people. And what we learned from this was that periods of acute air pollution, so when air pollution is high for a short period, is killing people. Yeah? So this was quite a transformation. But that was the piece that it told us. The next piece of evidence comes... Um, yeah, so the next piece of evidence comes from the 1990s with this thing called the Six Cities Study. And it's called this because they studied six cities. So what the researchers did was they selected six cities from the US that are reasonably different to one another. And they took about four or 5,000 people and followed them, not in a following them through the streets thing, but finding out about their health over a period of about 14 to 16 years. So before the days of the internet, what they used to do was each year they would post out a postcard to each of the people and it said, are you dead yet? <laughs> and when they didn't write back, 
they would send out a researcher to find out what had happened. And so they got a lot of details about the circumstances of uh, people's deaths. So if you look on the left-hand side, this um, is years. So they follow some people about 14 to 16 years. And this is the probability of survival. And you can see that everybody is alive at zero. And then after 14 to 16 years, you can start to see there's a divergence between how long people are living in these various places. Now, we know people's life chances are affected by things like poverty smoke, and personal factors like smoking, yeah? So all of these things are normalized and taken out of the analysis. You then plot the risk ratio of dying earlier against the PM2.5, and we end up with something that's basically a straight line relationship. And so that told us that the air pollution that we're breathing over periods of a decade to 15 years are causing people to die earlier. Peter? So, uh, the, the S on the graph there is about 30 micrograms per cubic metre. Yep. That, that was the same as the annual average in India. And... Oh no, the annual averages in India are considerably more than that. We're talking a couple of hundred <laughs> micrograms per cubic metre in Indian cities. Oh, I yeah. Sorry, I didn't realise Damn. I didn't do questions through, but is that just, that, that doesn't show causality though, does it? This is one of the problems with all of this um, and the whole of the evidence base that we have here, that these are observational studies. And it's only by beginning to pull together other types of evidence that we can get a sufficient connection. So they're associations, yeah? So this is one of the weaknesses in the air pollution evidence uh, arena, that what we have generally is associations. But when we've done other types of experimentation, be it on human beings themselves, yeah, you can find, we can find effects from exposure to air pollution, which helps us understand that it is a real effect. And there are also further studies, which I haven't featured here, which demonstrate reversibility. So there's a character called Bradford Hill, for those of you into these things, who set up a set of criteria where you can do these types of studies and you can go from just observing something all the way to causality. So the fact that we've got medical evidence to be able to support this on individuals, as well as we can do things like demonstrate reversibility when you take the air pollution away, the effect goes away, gives us a lot of confidence about what we're seeing. But it's an excellent question. So, there we learn that air pollution that you breathe over a decade or so is shortening your life. And that led to some radical ways in which we manage air pollution. So we set standards for what air pollution should be. And throughout the 1990s, we thought there was thresholds for which there was a safe level. And for those of you that have looked into this, you'll find that we have legislation in the UK, Europe and other places like that that set an acceptable limit for the worst air that you should breathe. Yeah? But science has moved on since that time. And what we're now looking at is through the science, I suppose, of the 21st century, we are learning that there's no real evidence that there is a threshold for no effect whatsoever, yeah? So there's this study here, which was done in the US, and here we have concentrations of PM2.5 along the bottom, and we have this hazard ratio, which is a probability of dying early because of the air pollution that you breathe, yeah? And you can see there is no evidence of a threshold within this. The effects go down to the lowest concentrations that the people are experiencing. One of the other things I often ask when I'm looking at an epidemiological study, I'm not an epidemiologist, is how many people were involved in this to try to get a kind of feel for the quality of the study. Um, this studied just over 60 million people in uh, the US that have their medical records kept through Medicare. So they're largely older people. But you can see there's absolutely no evidence so, health, uh, so what are the current limits in the UK uh, and in Europe? Our current limits for 2.5 are somewhere about here-ish, about 25 micrograms per cubic metre, so way off the scale. In the US, uh, it's 12, 
and there's been a bit of a hoo-ha about what limits should be set in the UK for the future and the UK government has opted for 10 um, to be achieved in 2040. Now 10 is, for those of you that follow those things, was recommended by the World Health Organization in 2005. So the government is really being ambitious by trying to achieve these recommendations 35 years after they were set. The WHO has set a new guideline, uh, and that's five. <laughs> so that's down the bottom. And what they've done is they've set that on the basis of saying, we've looked at all the studies for which there are around the world, and we're going we're gonna to set that at uh, the fifth percentile. So that's the, that's the lowest 20th of the measurements that are available. And we're going to have that as our standard. Yeah. Um, have you got some idea of what the um, levels of PM2 were pre-industrialization? living in the countryside what, what's the background like you have radiation there is a there is a natural background uh, from biogenic sources so trees give off various types of chemicals um, and you get some amount of wind blow and dust some amount of sea salt and things like that but we have concentrations that are in the single figures yeah so, but it does prove a challenge when it comes to reducing these. How are you going to achieve these very low levels when there is already a natural background? And that makes it very hard for policymakers. So moving on again, what I've talked about is deaths all the way through these. And I ask this other question now that's coming out from really quite recent evidence, which is, are the health harms from air pollution hiding in front of us in plain sight? in terms of the everyday ailments and chronic diseases that people are suffering from. So this UK study was published just before Christmas um, this year, and what they did was they looked at, is anyone in UK Biobank? I've never met anyone that is. Is anyone in UK Biobank? No? Half a million people in the UK are in a thing called UK Biobank, which was set up uh, just over 10 years ago. And these people all have samples lodged about themselves and also um, they're followed regularly with questionnaire data uh, on, on their health. So this looked at um, all the people who were quite old, so in their definition old was more than 45 that are in UK Biobank, of which I think there's about 300,000 of them, and half of them were suffering from more than one chronic disease, yeah? And they then looked at how the frequency of these chronic diseases um, related to air pollution. Here it is, M uh, PM 2.5 and NO2, I'm afraid it's a bit small, and what you can see is a linear relationship that the more PM 2.5 and the more NO2 that people were exposed to, the greater probability they have of having more than one chronic disease. So these chronic diseases are things not just that you would expect like respiratory things like asthma, for instance. We have lots of associations that are coming out now with mental health, dementia, yeah? And even now there was a study published just this week on osteoporosis and exposure to air pollution. So I ask the question and I don't really know the answer, but I think there's lots of growing evidence that many of the ailments that people are suffering with that are costing the NHS so much, they cost society so much because you can't go to work, maybe times of missed education in, in kids as well, um, and affecting people's life qualities are actually being um, caused or their probability is being increased by the air pollution that people are breathing. You then ask the question, and this is also at the cutting edge, is, is the air pollute, is things that we are, happen at one stage of our lives affect us later on? And I was part of this report, uh, the committee that did this report for Royal College of Physicians, um, which looked at all of these kind of ailments we know, like air pollution is affecting children before they're born, so miscarriages and kids that are born... Um, um, low, low, low birth mass for gestational age, yeah? They're not big enough for the time that they're born. Um, all the way through to dementia and ailments later on uh, in life. 
And, but what we couldn't do was we couldn't really connect them up and say that something that happened to you as a child will affect you later on. But there is some data starting to emerge. This one here, um, Anna Hansel and colleagues took a 1% sample of the, U of the England and Wales census and then followed these people through the next censuses for 40 years. And then they associated their probability of dying between censuses according to the air pollution they'd experienced. And here you can see that the biggest effect um, relates to the uh, recent 10 years that they'd had. These are people that died in 2010, but all the way back to the air pollution that they experienced in the 1970s could be seen in the health statistics that we have today. So air pollution could, that you experience in one time of your life could be affecting you later. So remember the London smog that I talked about earlier? So a study was done on uh, a cohort of people um, that were registered through the 1950s and they found that children, uh, this was published just a few years ago, children that were under the age of one or were in utero in London at the time of the 1952 smog then had a 20% greater chance of developing asthma as a child than the cohorts that were born either year side of them or were outside London, yeah? And a 10% chance, greater chance of developing asthma as an adult, um, although that's on the edge of the like, statistical significance. So there's mounting evidence that the things that happen to us in one part of our lives could affect the others. So there's a lot on children, of course. So this is where, you know, this is where you kind of set your life course. And I was part of this study where we went out in East London, uh, not me, but colleagues went out measuring the lungs of primary school children. So these were kids aged about eight or nine years old. And what we found was that children that were growing up in London were growing smaller lungs. Now, this was not clinically significant to them as kids, but if you think about members of your family when they've reached the ends of their lives, when they get flu or other sort of winter ailments, it's a real fight for breath, yeah? And many people still die of pneumonia at the ends of their lives. So if we're having a cohort of people that because of their childhood experience have smaller lungs when they reach adulthood, are we setting now a legacy of harm that we're only going to realize in uh, some decades time yeah so how much smaller are these kids lungs well they were losing lung volume the average child was losing lung volume equal to about two hen's eggs so if you think of a size of uh, an eight or nine year old perhaps you can think of one in your family their lung volumes were being reduced by about the volume of two hen's eggs. Yeah, so that's quite significant. How are we doing? So um, I'll quickly canter through some stuff about air pollution as it is now. I work mostly in London. This is London. This is data, this is a pollution map for 2019. And this is nitrogen dioxide. The legal limit, and there's been a lot of legal cases fought by Client Earth and others around this really quite successfully, holding the government's feet to the fires, to the fires, 40 micrograms per cubic metre, that's in here. So everything in these warmer colours above green all the way through uh, are areas that are exceeding the legal limits. Now the legal limits for nitrogen dioxide um, are set in uh, a directive in, um, well, it was revised in 2008, but I think they were originally set in 1996 to be achieved by 2010. And here we are more than a decade afterwards, and we still haven't done so. So the track record here is, is pretty appalling. In terms of the problematic areas, well, you can see the North Circular. You can't see, because it's harder to pick out the South Circular, where La Kissa Deborah lived. We can see roads in central London, and then we can, of course, see Heathrow Airport, which would actually be an entirely another talk uh, about the problems from uh, that. But that gives you an idea of the spatial distribution. For PM2.5, so this is small particulates, um, 
the UK and European limit is way off the top. It's down here at 25, so nowhere exceeds that, yeah? And it's really difficult that we adopted WHO guidelines for NO2, but we didn't do so for PM2.5. If we had have done, we'd be having a lot of legal action around that pollutant as well. In terms of how we're doing compared to the WHO's guidelines in, that were set in 25, uh, sorry, in 2005, well, all the areas that are in these warmer colours are exceeding it. So that's most of, uh, most of London. From a UK basis, we can do the same again and look at the UK concentrations. The scale's somewhat different. So everything that's above the WHO guidelines in 2005 um, is in the red colours. And you can see that it's a problem mainly of England and it's a problem of the South East. And that's because of the density of roads, cities, traffic that we have here. And also, we have to remember that we're part of a European-wide air mass. Yeah? The air that you breathe in Brighton today may have been in Paris yesterday. Tomorrow, it could be in Newcastle or Amsterdam. The PM2.5 pollution can stay there for, let's say, a week or so. Yeah? It travels around. So it's this proximity to other European cities as well as our own cities that gives us these problems. Um, WHO has set a new guideline of five micrograms, so all of London fails, pretty much all of the UK uh, fails apart from uh, parts of Scotland. Brighton, um, so these maps have been done by Sam Rouse here at the council. And Brighton is very good for a city of our size. We have a lot better air pollution information than many other comparable cities have. This is a map of nitrogen dioxide in Brighton. And just guiding you through the colour scale, the legal limit starts here at, at 40. So all the ones that are in the sort of warmer oranges uh, and reds are exceeding the legal limits. So no surprise, we have all the busy trafficked areas of, of, of the bypass, and you can just take a few minutes to think about where your house is. For those of you, of course, you know, everyone's familiar with the city. We, we're about here at the moment, so we're in, you know, one of the more polluted areas. Um, North Street, just down there, is one of the most polluted streets in the UK, actually. Um, so that's how we're doing in Brighton, and the situation isn't particularly good. So when I was planning this talk, I, I put out a tweet out there and I said, is anything anyone wants me to talk about? And the only response I got back was to talk about wood burning. Um, so I brought along a few slides on, on, on wood burning. Um, when you go back to 1952 and we had those horrendous smogs, the thing that they did to cure them really that was most effective was they changed the pollution that was being emitted from people's homes. This was a lot done for the introduction of smokeless fuels, but changing the way in which people burnt fuels. And the history of UK's air pollution then moves forward in that we had the advent of fossil gas, for those of you that are old or young enough to remember it, through the late 1960s and 1970s, and that carried us further in this. But that was largely a problem of what's happening in people's homes. So it was hard to get people persuaded about this because it was kicked back that only 18% of the coal that was being used in the UK was being used in people's homes. But that 80% of coal being used in people's homes was creating about 60% of the wintertime uh, pollution. Yeah, it's being burnt in open fires and pretty poor quality stoves. Today we have a situation where around 8% of UK homes are burning solid fuels. For the most part, people are burning wood these days. And um, that unfortunately creates more particle pollution than the exhausts of all of the traffic on our roads. So it's a really serious problem. It's compounded by uh, the fact that when people burn wood, they're doing so in neighbourhoods where, and at times, when all of their neighbours are indoors. So the numbers of people being exposed is actually quite high. And it's part of a trend. So if we go back about 20 odd years, people's living rooms look like this with the fireplaces boarded up, yeah? 
but over time people have been chiseling them open and reinstalling fireplaces or putting things like this in. Personally, I blame Grand Designs quite a bit for this. <laughs> so every episode of Grand Designs, they have two things at the end that they didn't have at the beginning. Normally one of them is a baby, because a lot of them have kids through each episode, and the other one is you'll find that they have some smart, really fancy wood burner um, in the home at the end of it. And so if you just go, and go down to like WH Smith's and get some of these lovely home magazines, you'll see loads of things that point to the desirability of um, home wood burning. If you look at the slides, there's some references you can pick up on. Around 150 to 200,000 stoves are being sold annually uh, in the UK. And for a long time, the vast majority of them didn't even, admit, didn't even meet the poor standards that were required in the 1950s. Um, so the thing to remember is whatever you're going to, whatever way you heat your home, solid fuels are the most polluting way uh, to do so. Um, a bit more, there's a couple of very large surveys were done uh, on this and Peter you were asking me before about primary PM 2.5 and wood burning. We now think that about 27% of all of the particle pollution that's emitted in the UK, that's different to what we breathe, but is emitted, is coming from solid fuel burning. About three quarters of that is from wood burning, and that is more than twice what we're getting from all of the vehicles that are on the roads. Um, this is coming from about 8% of UK homes, though it does vary quite a lot. If you go to Northern Ireland, for instance, so fossil gas only reached Northern Ireland uh, around 1990, or the island of Ireland, so there's a lot more solid fuel burning goes on there, just because they haven't, many communities don't have fossil gas. Um, if you look at these homes that do so, um, only 4% of homes that are burning wood are actually reliant on it for heating, yeah? Um, when they ask people questions about this, this was okay before a cost of living crisis, but only 8% of people said that they were burning wood for necessity. The others were people were burning it for tradition because they'd always done so or their family had done so, and the others were burning it for aesthetics. Yeah, so this counted for um, 46%. We hear a lot that people are burning wood because it's difficult to heat your home otherwise. And if you live off gas grid, it's really hard to heat your home. Yeah, if you're dependent on fuel oil, it's really, really difficult. And has been for a decade or so because fuel oil is basically the same as diesel. So they're in competition with all the diesel cars for the same product to heat their homes. But... 46% of people that are burning wood are in the top two social classes, yeah? So this is a very large proportion of middle and really upper middle class people are burning wood. Quite a few people burn wood outdoors, I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, and we do have to remember, and I won't go into this now, you can ask me later, but it is not climate neutral. It is actually extremely harmful to the climate to burn wood. Yeah, at least within the time scale of several decades or about a century. And we're really worried about climate tipping points. Don't burn wood. Yep. Um, so a couple of bits of data. The people that try to sell stoves have got this kind of look over here thing. They're saying you shouldn't regulate stoves unless you can regulate barbecues, bonfires and all of the rest because they're the main problem. And they try to say this is the main problem and not their stoves. Um, so what we did here, this is um, a paper I had out just last year. This is a, a typical year, because we took about 10 years, uh, running from January to December, and these are the concentrations of air pollution from wood burning. Um, we made some adjustments due to the weather, yeah, and you can see that the times of year in the summer when people have barbecues and bonfires, the concentrations are considerably lower than they are in the winter. Yeah, this is a wintertime effect. There won't be many people in December who are out there barbecuing in their garden in the evenings. When do we see wood burning? Well, we see it in the evenings. This is time of day, here's concentrations. We see humps in the evenings. It's a home thing. It's happening in people's homes. It's happening in the evenings. The interesting thing is it doesn't seem to actually be getting any worse, despite all of these stoves that are being sold. And this is a real conundrum for us. So what I hypothesize 
and perhaps the next slide would help. Um, there is this, I don't know if you've seen this, but there is this hierarchy that's put about by DEFA. And if you like, the size of the cloud, if you can imagine there, is an indicator. So the area of the cloud is an indicator of the amount of PM 2.5 that's being produced from each of the types of devices in your home. So completely clean your electricity compared to your open fire with this massive cloud here. And there's a hierarchy between open fires and the more, more, more modern sort of eco-design stoves. You go from that cloud uh, to this one here. But the problem is when people invest in stoves, they tend to use them a lot more than they do their open fires. So surveys have found that the average stove user, you might be taking a home from this cloud to this cloud, but the chances are they burn and use their stove twice as much because they've invested in it. Yeah, which is completely understandable. So it's a lovely thing to do, but it is undoubtedly the most polluting way to heat your home. One of the other things, um, it's not just a cost of living crisis, it's not everybody is burning really nice wood, um, which they're chopping down woodland and uh, the effects this might be having on our biodiversity, I don't know, really trouble me quite a lot. But people are also burning waste wood. So I wrote these pieces for The Guardian, wrote this one a little while ago, arsenic is being found in the air in London and Manchester. So construction wood for many, many years was impregnated with arsenic to stop um, fungal rot and to stop wood boring insects. Yeah, set fire to that. The arsenic either ends up in the ash in your fire, you breathe it in when you sweep it out, or it goes up the chimney. So here's some data which this was based on, two time series. The uh, blue line is a marker of uh, wood burning pollution. It's fine potassium, if anyone's interested, but we can go there later. The orangey brown one is arsenic. So you can see at the times that we're seeing spikes of chemicals from wood burning, we're also seeing large quantities of arsenic in London's air. Okay, so that's kind of where we are now. So let's think about solutions and let's think about the future. Now, I don't know about everyone from whatever age, but when I was young, I was promised the future would look like this. And by now, of course, I would have flying cars taking me to work and things like this. Um, and it's not really quite, uh, quite the same when I was going to work in Space Fleet headquarters. Um, I will say a word of warning on this. I often get called onto radio programs and media when air pollution hits the headlines and they say, come on and tell us three things that everyone can do to help the problem. And there are things that all of us can do to help the problem, but be very careful, and this is very important with climate as well, be careful of the framing around this. So when air pollution gets quite bad in the UK, we have a scale where there's government warnings that are issued, yeah? And what's the advice when air pollution gets bad? It says here at level 10, Adults and children, blah, blah, blah. Older people should avoid strenuous physical activity and basically don't go outside. So when air pollution gets bad in the UK and those hot days in summer and those times in winter, we tell the people who are most vulnerable, whose health is most likely to have been damaged from air pollution, that they must modify their behavior. Yeah, it is just pure victim blaming. I was part of the committee that wrote this and we had a lot of debate around exactly this point. Um, but we felt that it's something we, we could do at that time, so it was reasonable to tell people, but you've got to be careful about the framing. Yeah. So Michael Mann, has anyone read his books? No? Yeah, he does a lot of, anyway, he's a climate scientist, and he says, this is mainly a climate thing, there are things individuals can do to minimise their personal carbon footprints, yeah, but we must not allow the polluters to reframe the discussion such that it falls upon, entirely upon individuals and takes the pressure off them. So all the way through in things that can be done, yeah, there are things you can do, but there are also bigger issues at play here that need things to change. So rather than thinking about perhaps things we could do, you can start thinking about what a smog-free city would look like. I did this piece for The Guardian a little while ago, you know, so we debate electric versus diesel versus petrol, but shouldn't we be thinking about getting the transport right, yeah? 
we should be thinking about the way in which we heat our homes and the way we insulate them as well. We should be thinking about the space in our cities and thinking about green space and parkland rather than roads, yeah? So I'll just pull a few of these. Now, I said I'm not going to put the blame on everyone as an individual, and I'm not, but there is a lot you can do in terms of travel. These are statistics from DFT from 2016 about the length of journey. So 23% of car journeys are less than two miles and 60% are less than five miles. Two miles is things that really you could walk it and by the time you get in the car, park it, you arrive there in the same time walking. Yeah, so there's lots of opportunities to change that. Five miles is a little bit longer. Everybody who I show this to says, oh, you're from London, that's the way it is. These are national figures. So what would it look like if we could shift more people away from their cars into walking, cycling, and public transport, which requires a bit of walking as well? So we have the opportunity here, rather than just this debate about petrol, diesel versus electric, yeah, to do so much better for public health. If we can get people out of their cars and into active modes of travel. Well, yeah, we can help air pollution, right? We can help our climate emergency as well. We can help the urban noise that we don't talk about enough that plagues the lives of so many people that live close to major roads. And even better than that, if we can get people doing a bit of regular daily exercise, then that can relieve some of the huge pressures that are on the NHS and the huge sort of diseases of inactivity that many of us suffer from. So there are huge opportunities here if we were to get this right and move beyond just, you know, diesel versus petrol, we're going to convert them to electric and keep the same amount of transport. Um, I talked about UK Biobank, you know, the chronic disease study I talked about earlier. Here's another study from UK Biobank. So it's about half a million people in UK Biobank, uh, around half of those, so 260,000 people were workers or are workers, and they looked at them for five years, just five years, and they managed to see that the people who cycled to work were living longer than anyone else who was being looked at in UK Biobank, and those people that were walking to work had less heart disease. And that's just following people and the death rates over five years. It's, you know, it, the opportunities to do something for public health are just fantastic. We have this cycle hire scheme in Brighton, which is being kind of revamped at the moment. Uh, there's, there's, there's many of them now. So this was the London one. That one of the very earliest ones was in Barcelona. Has anyone been to Barcelona? Yeah, I, I didn't take the bikes. But when they set them up, um, they were really worried whether they'd actually done good or, or not. So you take people onto their bikes and they're on the roads and they have a greater probability of having an accident and they're in the, when they're in their cars, yeah? That, that's true. It's not that much greater, but it is true. And because they're breathing all this air pollution and puffing and panting away, getting all their physical exercise, their dose could be higher although the people in the car actually experience loads of air pollution because they followed the exhaust of the car in front. So they said, well, are we doing a net good or not? So they stacked up all of these things and they found this sort of benefit to disbenefit ratio. So there were some disbenefits, but the benefits from the healthy exercise in cycling the couple of kilometers on one of the higher bikes outweighed them by a ratio of 70 to one. So it's not just double good, 70 times better than the disbenefits from the cycling. These studies have been done quite a few times since and the values have come down, but they settle at about 50, yeah? Um, but we always talk about personal mobilities, think about deliveries. Yeah, now we have lots and lots of deliveries. You can talk to a transport manager and they will be able to tell you loads of statistics about how many people use the bus stop, what bus patronage is, if you're in London, the tubes and the routes and things like that. Point out the window when an HGV goes past, I challenge you to do it if you're ever in a meeting and say, where's that going? And they all go, I ain't got a clue. So we need to really think about the way that objects move around our areas and they do it really inefficiently. 
So TfL did a survey of vans. Yeah, vans have really expanded hugely on our roads since the turn of the century. And they found that a quarter of them, uh, sorry, 39% of them were less than a quarter full. So they're driving round largely empty. It's just incredibly inefficient. If you want to think about a quarter of a van, that's about 100 kilos, which instantly, interestingly is about the load that one of these cycle uh, contraptions, one of these cycle uh, delivery bikes uh, can carry. That can carry about 100 kilos. Now, I talked also about, remember I said about driving less and things like that? Well, you've got to think about who this message is going to. So this is Brighton and Hove, and this data come out of the census a couple of months ago from the last census, and it's all about vehicle ownership or households that own vehicles. And you remember, this is our pollution map of Brighton, yeah? And this is where the households are that own the vehicles. And we have places in the centre of the city and up along the most polluted arterial routes where 70, 80% of homes don't own a car. So telling the people that are in the most polluted places that they should simply drive less, well, a lot of them don't drive anywhere at all. They just don't have a car. So we have to really think about this messaging. It's the people that are living outside the polluted areas that are causing the problems. So there's a huge, huge environmental justice angle here, which we just don't talk about. No, not all of it is, but the nitrogen dioxide predominantly is. You can see the way it follow, it's following the road network, yeah? Oh, sorry, buses, yeah. Yep, uh, buses is a really good point. I'll come to buses in, in a moment, yeah? But that's a really good, really good point. So, um, what ways to do this? Well, it's no point telling people you shouldn't drive you have to think about why people are driving. And I really like this concept of 15 minute neighborhoods. Somehow they've come immensely controversial. Have you read all this stuff recently? 15 minute neighborhoods seem to be a Sheffield socialist conspiracy. And I don't really understand what the conspiracy part is in making sure that my dad has a corner shop that at the age of 88 he can walk to, yeah? Or that, I know, daughter over there can walk to the pub or doesn't have to walk too far when she's coming back at gone four o'clock in the morning last night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the 15 minute neighborhood just says you can have everything within 15 minutes. And let's face it, our city, this city was built in that way. We've got corner shops, we've got areas with you know small sets of branches of the co-op all over the place what we need to do is to invest in them we need to make sure that you do have a shop you can walk to you do have a park you do have a doctor's surgery you do have a library yeah it's no point telling people don't drive if they don't have a choice the same applies in the countryside as well how many villages do you go to when you're out for a walk in the countryside no shop left yeah I tried to give a talk on this in Dorking, and that's quite a conservative place. And they said, what are you going to talk about? And I explained this, and they said, but that's rubbish, we can't do this. And I said, well, everywhere in Dorking is within about 20 minutes of a really actually pretty useful town centre. Lots of good shops, yeah, things like that. They decided they, so I explained this, and I said this is what I was going to talk about, and uh, they disinvited me. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the solutions not look like? We hear loads about urban greenery and basically once the air's polluted, it's really difficult to clean it. We have to solve the problem at source, yeah? So trying to clean polluted air is like trying to take the milk out of my cup of tea. Oops, <laughs> it's taking my cup of tea out the mug, isn't it? Um, it's really, really, really difficult. So here's a couple of examples. This green wall is just north of Oxford Circus and it was meant to be cleaning up all of the air pollution around Oxford Circus, and really it isn't. And it's mostly dying, yeah? yeah. This is a school which I cycle past whenever I'm going to work uh, in London, and this 
green wall here is meant to be protecting the kids from the air pollution, you see the windows are open, from this traffic. No way it is, it's just a simple piece of physics. It is not working. This really exists. This is a smoke tower in a Chinese city and this is meant to be cleaning the air from the whole city. And if you just think about it, yeah, look in the distance there. If it was cleaning that air, it would have to be sucking so fiercely, it'd be dragging cars off the road, <laughs> wouldn't it? You know, it's just a simple piece of physics. It's very difficult to clean polluted air. There's a lot of air out there. We have to make sure we have the right solutions. Why is this important? I sat with an MP in Parliament, uh, a woman MP from South West London, and she said, why are you telling me all of these difficult things that I have to do to stop people driving their diesel cars and things like that? She said, I went along to the opening of a green wall in a primary school in my constituency, and that is protecting the children from air pollution. We don't need to do anything more. And I went and looked at the pictures of her and the smiling children. And basically the green wall was about the size of the privet hedge that was in my nan's front garden. There's no way this was working, but in, it's taking the political bandwidth away from solutions that actually work. There is a space for urban greenery. There's an important space for urban greenery. Um, has anyone heard this it's sort of urban myth? People recover sooner from operations if they can look out the window and see greenery. So I wrote a piece for The Guardian. I mean, everyone's heard this, yeah? And it is actually based on a real live scientific paper. There's a paper in science about this uh, from um, really quite a long time ago. I can't read that. I think it's 1984. And yes, it is, it, there is a study that supports this. So they had loads of people that were going in to have pretty much all the same operation, yeah? And they looked at which sides of the wall they were in and which they were looking at, and the people with greenery did recover sooner. So there is a tremendous amount of evidence out there that having greenery in our cities is not only good for things like divert biodiversity that my friend Dan here is very much interested in, but it's actually good for our mental well-being. Yeah? So if you can go out to a local park or something like that, it's actually really good for your mental health. Yes? Is it true that Um, London plane trees were always thought to be very good at clearing air pollution, um, but that's mainly because they survived in Victorian London because they shed their bark, yeah? There are a lot of people that really suffer from allergens and lots of people that have asthma aggravated by allergens and silver birch is actually one of the worst for that. So you have to be really careful what you plant in urban areas. Peter. I understand that the reason for that might be because the pollen itself can latch on to air pollution and when you breathe that becomes toxic and it makes you allergic to that. Mm. Yeah, there's some, I'm not an expert in this, but there's some sort of um, antagonistic relationships between air pollution and allergy. Ultra low emission zone, um, I just have to quickly say that it is working. Um, this is air pollution alongside roads in London, 2010 to 2023, yeah? And I'll draw your attention to the red line. These are the roads in central London, uh, in that little area where the ULES was first introduced. And you can see in the couple of years before the build up to the ULES, when people were changing all of their fleets, upgrading buses and things like that, we saw in terms of nitrogen dioxide concentrations, one of the most dramatic changes I've ever seen in 30 years of measuring air pollution. We thought the instruments had gone wrong. Things were changing so quickly. So did this analysis, TFL did this analysis, but I, I was part of the review process. I was kind of a critical friend to it. And what we did was we said, well, the argument against these things is that fleet is renewed anyway. People buy newer vehicles naturally, yeah, when the old ones wear out and they emit less pollution. So we introduced a counterfactual into this, which is what would have happened anyway, yeah? So for our counterfactual for central London, we used the changes that we'd seen right in the outer <coughs> suburbs, yeah? 
And that way, that also allowed for changes in weather and things like that between different places and seasonality. So that's our counterfactual. So this is what we think would have happened in central London without the ULES. The difference between these is the impact of the ULES and of course the less traffic we're seeing because of COVID. But even with the return of traffic to the central area as it's going up here, you can see that there's still a benefit from it. It's really dramatic in terms of air pollution close to roads. In the inner areas, you can see we did the same again and there's a divergence when it was taking out to the north and south circulars and you can see that there's a benefit here between the two taking the same approach. This is the real world. The, this one here is our counterfactual about what would have happened. So there is an improvement between the two. And at the moment, the mayor of course is trying to take it out to the whole of London where the changes in air pollution in outer London will be a lot smaller, but of course outer London has a lot older and much more vulnerable population. Yes, sorry. Could you turn that into a number of lives saved? Or? You could do. Um, one of the difficulties with this is that this is mainly the air pollution close to, pe close to roads, yeah? So the air pollution further away, the changes are less dramatic. Some of my colleagues are working on a study where they're actually trying to look at people's exposure through the whole of their day. So the time they spend, let's say, on a transport environment, because it improves, you know, if you're on the bus, the fact that the roads have less pollution actually makes quite a significant difference. So there are people working on it at the moment. So I think watch this space. I, um, Brighton, as I said, North Street. So that's the little bit up there. We have our own. Uh, ultra low emission zone so it tells me on the bus when that cute little kid's voice comes on doesn't it whenever you enter it um, so Brighton is really has quite a, you could say it has an issue with buses because each bus is individually quite polluting but each bus could be carrying 80 odd people yeah so it's quite efficient in those terms but still every bus route in the city goes up and down North Street, doesn't it? I can't think of, I don't think I can think of a single one that doesn't go along there, yeah? So everyone goes along there. This has led to some of the highest NO2 concentrations in the countryside, in the country, uh, over 120 micrograms per cubic metre against the legal limit, which is 40, so that's three times higher. The upgrading the buses and the taxis that use this has made an impact, and you can see that those concentrations uh, have fallen. I mean, there's a lot more that still needs to be done there. But that's partly because of the way the city's organised. So one thing could be electrifying buses. And you can see here's a big lemon smiley driver of an electric bus. But interestingly, I don't know if anyone knows, but Brighton for a long time at the start of the 20th century had the world's largest fleet of electric buses. Um, and you can see these, these ones here. There is actually a garage that does MOTs out in East Brighton that's a listed building on account of its role within this electric bus fleet. They were really clever. They, they solved the charging time problem. So the bus would go in uh, to this depot, which is in East Brighton, go up on the ramps, and in the space of five minutes, they would swap out the batteries and they would put in new batteries and the bus would go off again. Immensely popular because they weren't chugging diesel, pulling out, well, petrol at that time, pulling out lots of smoke. But uh, through a sad set of financial circumstances, uh, we don't have them any longer. Um, oh, everyone knows this. Where's the place in the UK, in England, with the highest level of bus patronage outside London by a huge way? It's here, yeah. So more, we have more bus journeys per head than anywhere else in the UK outside London. It's a huge success story. Um, so, and this is hugely more, you can't read this, but this is hugely more than places like Nottingham, Reading, Tyne and Weir, uh, the whole of the West Midlands, yeah? We have nearly twice as many bus journeys as the whole of Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool. It's just huge per person, yeah? We love our buses. So other things you can do, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious, I need to speed through. So the other things you can do, and I know this is all about the personal responsibility, but just think about where you're walking. So loads of people arrive at Euston Station in London and need to get to King's Cross. The vast, vast majority of them walk 
along um, Euston Road where they're sharing this air with about 70 or 80,000 vehicles a day. Yeah? If you just walk slightly to the north, uh, past the back of the British Library and the Crick, yeah, you can reduce your exposure to traffic pollution by about half. And my colleagues Andrew and others went and did a lot of this walking the two routes to find the difference. So walk through the park, walk through the back roads, and you can actually make a tremendous difference. Um, but let's take it a little bit further. You know, we've got vulnerable kids. We know that they're, they're growing, you know, lungs. So what can we do to protect them? One of the great movements coming out there, I think, is school streets. So these simply close off the streets around uh, a school for the time that the kids are arriving and leaving about an hour a day. We know that that reduces, well, studies have shown that reduces uh, traffic there, of course, um, but it also reduces the nitrogen dioxide and it increases the number of kids that are taking active modes of travel to school. I think if ever you watch one of these school streets, it's fantastic. When the, I watched the one um, when Downs first opened there, Downs Infants, and there was all this traffic and stuff like that on that side road. And then they went and closed them off and everybody, parents, kids, whatever, they just moved off this narrow one metre that we have either side and they filled the street. They were chatting, kids were running around on scooters, playing with balls. Look, look at all these people here. This is genuinely creating a community. And that is another bonus of them as well. So, you know, it's just a no-brainer that we should be having school streets everywhere, including on the busy roads, and most especially on the busy roads. Um, so thinking about roads, let's go a little bit further and think perhaps about taking them out of our cities. So there's John Burke, who was a councillor in North London, described traffic as kind of like an invasive species. It comes into the city, it changes, it completely swamps all other types of transport, yeah? And it actually changes the dynamic of a city, it changes the priorities. We get things where you have to have a car to be able to access them. And this has massive issues with social inclusion. So this is Seoul in South Korea. This is a road that took traffic into the centre of the city, yeah? This is two pictures of it, it's massive. So we've got this flyer, and as it got bigger, they just built more and more. The mayor, uh, who's been elected many times since, said the problem is not going to be solved by building more road. And actually, he did the opposite. He ripped the road out completely. So this went to this, because the road followed the course of a river that was in the city before. So they ripped out the road, they unearthed the river again, and they created what is now just a green transport corridor and a place for people to relax in the centre of the city. I mean, this little kid here, are, are him or her, are wearing their crocs, just splashing there in this, compared to what the situation we had here? Come on. It's just, you know, so much value of the city. Everyone said the traffic would be complete chaos. No, it wasn't. <laughs> People just found other ways to get to the city centre. It's been done in, uh, I think this is Utrecht. Uh, this here was reverted back into the canal that it was before. So we should start changing our cities and actually start thinking about ripping out road infrastructure and turning them into green spaces or green transport corridors. We have to look beyond traffic. I haven't got time to go into the details, but agriculture is a massive, massive pollution source. Yeah, so the fertiliser that's used and what comes out the back of cows as well. We have to think about the personal care products that we're using in our homes. How many people, how many of you have a printer in your home? Yeah, lots of people like for the computer. Mm, a fair few, but we're putting solvents into our homes and putting solvents into the outside world. So summertime pollution, more of it is now being caused by the products we use in our home than all of industry put together. <clears throat> it's a massive problem. Tire and brake wear, huge problem going forward. Electrify the vehicles, they still have tires. Um, and well, they don't really have brakes in the same way. But these are things that we really must tackle. But you know, there's another question here, should we be actually thinking about building a right to a healthy environment uh, around the structures of things that we do? 
And many countries, 80% of countries in the world have some sort of constitution that supposedly guarantees the right to a healthy environment. And um, this is a growing momentum national, uh, internationally. The UK is not really interested in it. There's a clean air human rights bill, uh, Ella's Law, that's going through Parliament that partly does this. And the reason I want to do it is, is for these bunch of kids here. So they're in a school in North London and there's an Ocado depot that wants to be built. And I visited this and it is right against the school playground, yeah? Vehicles will be coming in the other side of the fence. The nearest point from the school classroom to the depot is just over, I think, just over two metres, yeah? And there is nothing legally that's probably going to stop this happening. Yeah? There are lots of things the residents are doing. But if we had a right to clean air, then you could look at this case and you could say, OK, it hadn't really been considered in the law up until this point, but if we want to weigh up this new situation that we have, we would weigh it heavily towards the rights of the children to have clean air rather than the developer to build their depot. So that's why we need a rights agenda. So it fills in the spaces when we get new cases and it gives us a governing set of principles for how we tackle the problem. People are interested in climate here. So uh, my colleague Martin Williams, who sadly died a few years ago, sketched this on the back of a pamphlet. And what he said was, well, actually the napkin, literally a napkin uh, at a dinner. And what he says that we need the right solutions for our climate emergency as well as our air pollution one. And we're not doing very well. Some of the things we've had, like the dieselization of our vehicle fleet, yeah, was put originally for climate. People are burning wood, uh, apparently, for climate. These things are disasters for air pollution and for our health. And we need to ensure that we take a pathway through this that is most beneficial for, for each agenda. So updating Martin's thinking to more modern things, what should we be having? Well, we should be moving away from diesel vehicles, urban combined heat and power, biomass burning. We should be thinking about solar wind power, perhaps electric vehicles, heat pumps, active travel, home insulation, livable cities. These are all solutions that work well for air pollution uh, and health. Now, I'm really, really bad at graphics. So what I wanted to do with this was try and create a third axis that comes out of the figure, yeah? So you're just gonna have to imagine along with me that there is a third axis. And this third axis is health benefit. And the reason I put it there is that within this air pollution and climate sort of win-wins, we have other things that could be different for health. So if we just swapped our vehicle fleets, as we said before, from petrol, diesel to electric, we miss so many opportunities to do something for health. If we just fit every home with a heat pump, then we still have loads of people living in fuel poverty and in poor quality homes, and their health will be suffering as a result. So if we invest in the homes with better insulation, it reduces the energy that's required, helps air pollution, helps climate and also will help people's health. So that's the type of axis we need to be looking at health, our climate and air pollution emergencies. There's a very nice uh, and talented woman I work with on the clean air program I did for a while called Alice who tried to redraw my diagram and I think this one probably works better in that there is a sort of Venn diagram, uh, Venn yeah, diagram with some benefits that sit in the middle with home insulation, active travel and healthy cities and some that help air pollution and climate like electric vehicles, but they're not the most beneficial ones. So lastly, we really need to be stop seeing air pollution as a problem. You go to politicians, I've talked to enough of them, and they say something, it's, you know, air pollution was there on the desk when they arrived in the job, right? And if they're lucky, they won't get in trouble with it and it still be there on the desk when they leave, yeah, for the next person. And that's probably about their ambition for many of them to do with it. So if we can remap air pollution from being a problem to an opportunity to do something for public health, then you know, there's so much more that could be done and needs to be done. And that's part of what 
needs to change in this political and social landscape. We've got to stop seeing air pollution as a problem, and we've got to start seeing it as an opportunity to do something different. You could say that the same with our climate emergency as well. So what could our cities look like? Well, we could be living in places like this. And you know, this is just outside here, so to some extent we are. All of these places exist. We could think about repurposing our streets to places where people can sit and chat, yeah? Introduce a bit of biodiversity, cycleways, and you know, places with clean, active travel, and places where kids can play outside. I mean, this lad here, he's really beaming from ear to ear because he's in the <coughs> middle of his space hopper in the middle of a road that's been closed. So, I'm going to end at this point. I'm sorry I've talked really, really too long, so I apologise for that. Um, so, this has been talking about how do we know about the harms from air pollution, so hopefully you've got some idea about the evidence base behind those, and what can we do about it, and the whole thing that it's not really about, it's not entirely about individual responsibility, it's also about the places in which we live, which we can't as individuals shape, but we can persuade the people that can control these things to shape them in the most beneficial way. So I'm going to stop there. I have written a book and I have absolutely no shame in giving it a plug. So if you fancy it, at the moment it's in third edition, cheap small form paperback, £8.36 from Waterstones just up the road. Or you could walk that direction to the Jubilee Library and Brighton and Hove City Council have four copies that you can just borrow for free. So you know, whatever's your fancy, but if you've been interested in air pollution from what I've said, then go out and uh, get yourself a copy. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your questions. <laughs>